I'm a maritime archaeologist, but um, I don't dive and I don't sail. So although I, I like the quote from Zorba the Greek, it um, doesn't actually particularly appeal to me, but, um, <laughs> but I've done work in this area. So I put these two quotes up because they sort of sum up um, my method and um, hopeful outcome. So the Robin Farr um, quote about a appropriate prehistoric map would presumably require stretching and warping to present travel time rather than invariant spatial relations sums up my method in a way. So taking data and saying, well, the modern Western map in maritime settings, especially ancient maritime settings, is probably pretty useless. And how useful can network analysis be if um, we're using invariant spatial relations in a maritime setting? This is a map from 1981 I just put up um, from some geographers, Dickens and Lloyd. I just love the name of it. So it's a, it's a map showing the introduction of um, transatlantic um, plane travel and how it's stretched. It brought in far parts of the world versus land travel in the UK. I just liked it because they called it the unevenness of space-time convergence. Just sounded very um, space age to me for something relatively mundane. Um, I guess the importance of maritime networks across um, Brewbank's Middle Sea um, is being ride, widely written on. In terms of actual work in networks, um, Lee Wanger has been doing work with GIS to model seafaring in the Dodecanese nice, over towards Rhodes there. We have Patton's Oak Island socio-geographies, Dawson's work on island abandonment, Malkin's social agents in the small Greek world, and Tartaron's social networks. So that's a sort of background to what I've been reading to try and put together um, this work. This is just a map of um, the area we're going to talk about and although my work covers all the sites shown here, I'm going to focus with the maps I show you today on four sites. And um, this is based, the starting point for me was some work done by um, Napit, Evans and Rivers to produce some um, maritime networks using network analysis in this region and these are the sites they used. These are their maps or a selection of them. And I've been testing some key routes in here, replacing their measure of just Euclidean distance between sites in their model with one of maritime travel time and a new measure that I've come up with called risk. That was my interpretation of risk, but really it's a, if you, if you, when we look at the maps, you think of it as a relative risk. So whether my measure of risk is right, I don't know, but um, it's something we can use to measure the relative risk of travel across this region. And um, Napa Evans and Rivers' work developed through quantitative and spatial modelling. Um, and they came up with this model with a final one called Ariadne. And um, the input parameters included the fixed local resources, the size of the population, giving each site a, what they term a carrying capacity. But distance, which they acknowledged was not very useful, was um, just Euclidean distance between these sites. And it was omnidirectional, sailing from one site to another. It's the same as sailing from another site to another. Now that, just common sense, is stupid. You know, that isn't how uh, maritime travel works. And they've used this as a platform to then investigate some things. The main thing they did was investigate the removal of Thera following the eruption of Santorini to see what happened to the network. And the proposed models, we go from um, rank and busyness. The final one, Ariadne, is what I'm going to focus on. That's their preferred one. This is how, how the networks worked across this region, region in the Middle Bronze Age. You can see that the um, combined version shows a very strong link between Knossos and Thera, the dark line at the bottom there. Um, and that's been interpreted by Napa as an unambiguous gateway to the Cyclades, as the superhighway, if you like, about how Minoan and Minoan culture made it into this region, how they, how they maintain connections. The other things you can notice are the relative stability across their different models, apart from that major link. No connection at all between Crete and the Dodecanese Islands in a direct uh, measure. And weak connections really up the whole coast of the Peloponnese. But it does give us a model, and it's what they've done, to sort of test the stability and temporal susceptibility, which I think is interesting from a mapping point of view. You know, a map is not the use of a map, if you like, if you're the interpretation, you've got to take in the temporal element as well about how that changes over time. But Euclidean distance is obviously a weak measure to have in this model. Um, I'm going to skip through quickly, really, my background in terms of the data I've got and show you some maps and some data because I like the term invitation. Hopefully, what I've built is a, is a, 
a platform that you can then try to get to Synbex uh, message of it being a useful model to then look at data. But if it's not robust and it's um, not a good model, um, we can't really use it or trust it. So the things I've considered are sailing technology, wind, currents, and taking that then to produce this measure of risk, which also takes into account uh, possible nights spent at sea um, and possible harbours en route, on the assumption that given choice, you know, putting a ship together, putting a cargo together and setting out to trade in the Aegean or even now is a risky prospect. Why would you take a high risk route? And one of the highest risks as we'll see is spending nights at sea. So my risk measure is predominantly based on the amount of time you're away from the coast. There's been a lot of discussion about whether in the Middle Bronze Age it could actually sail into the wind. Um, we know the sail was introduced probably from Crete. Brewbank puts it at about 2000 BC. And we've got about 400 um, seals or iconographic images with sails on across the whole region. You see here the square rectangular sail. Normal, uh, a basic square rectangular sail doesn't give you ability to sail windward. Uh, you can sail with the wind, but you can't sail into the wind. Without being able to sail into the wind, this network changes entirely. Now, so vital is whether they did have the ability to sail into the wind. Um, Giorgio argues that this depiction from Thera, very famous, um, the rigging is, a, is an indication that they did have ability to sail into the wind. White Wright argues the same, agrees that there would have been some limited ability, although he is he questions actually how much they could sail into the wind, how, how much progress they could make <coughs> against the wind. And even with the advent of the sail, experimentation with brailing, all the boats would still have been important, but probably just for getting into harbour. And these old galleys coupled with square sails could only make significant progress with the wind and were susceptible to high waves um, and seas. Brugbrank has calculated the um, optimal performance of some some wrecks um, that you'll be familiar with, I'm sure. Um, you see them there, the max speed um, of the Oliveram wreck and the Geladonia wreck. I think they're very high. A full-scale replica of the 5th century trireme, the Olympias, only managed seven knots consistently, and it was found to have almost no tolerance to waves. So fine in, in nice flat water, you still you can only go seven knots. So. Most people now would assume that you're, the, you're talking about half of that even, so three and a half to four knots is actually pretty good progress. And not being a sailor, I've spent quite a lot of time hanging out online in sailing forums. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and pretty much that hasn't changed. If you're sailing in the southern Aegean, most sailors are going to make their calculations based on a progress, an average progress of about four to five knots. So even that hasn't actually changed. And we'll come on probably to why is to do with the currents and the winds in this area. There's a, there's a newer calculation called hull speed, which is based on the length of a hull and is just a calculation you plug in your, your hull dimensions into. And that actually agrees with these ships having about a speed of about four to five knots. So I assume most people do now that there was some ability to sail into the wind. So that's good, so I can put that in my calculations. I've got some average speeds to start with. So putting that all in, um, I've got some data that I build in, sailing into the wind, sailing with the wind, sailing into an oblique wind, sailing into a side wind. So obviously there's, there's more research and data behind this, but um, these are the figures I put in. Um, have any of you ever sailed in the Aegean? Um, it's a windy place. All summer, the uh, Maltemi blows from the north, um, <coughs> starting up here in Turkey. And this catabatic wind can be very harsh and give difficult sailing conditions throughout the summer months, May to October. Brubank again would argue that that was the key sailing time. So the key time you want to trade across this region, you've got the worst weather from a sailing point of view. And modern sailing advice is the same. Um, it suggests avoiding sailing windward, especially in the Sea of Crete, big sea at the bottom, where the Meltemi can whip up storms to about eight bow foot, which can blow for 10 hours, and those can whip up within a few hours. You could be having a nice sail, suddenly you're in the midst of a storm. It might be sunny. 
Um, and there's some localized wind patterns. I haven't put them into my model. Um, I've taken this whole area. There are some real localized patterns which would change um, these networks on a much more micro scale, a local scale. But I'm looking at the bigger network. I've also considered surface currents. This is at a very large level. I've looked at some um, more sort of meso scale um, currents in some of the key areas I'm looking into. Um, the key elements are that um, you've got these circuitry systems. Now, cu currents don't actually affect sailing as much as wind at all, uh, but they, ha they do have an effect. And from this upper schematic, um, we can generally say that the best, you know, the most obvious routes around this are from Crete towards Rhodes and the Dodecanese, just starting out at Crete, from the Peloponnese down to Crete, and from Thera and the Cycladic Islands downwards south. Those are the sort of easiest currents to follow. I'm not going to go through this in detail again, but there's then a set of adjustments that go in. So for every journey in this network, there's 1,200 of them, all this goes into crunch and you get a sailing time from any port to any port. And comes up, so I've just picked one here. If you're sailing, starting out at Philokopi and you want to go to Knossos, you've got a distance to travel, you're going with the wind, you're going with the current. This is obviously generally, it's not always going to be the case. Uh, you don't have to tack, you're not going into the wind. Um, you've got an average speed, so it's a, it's a day's sail. So that's quite a nice, easy, easy route to imagine. So some maps, which is really what they want to get onto. So these are the islands, then split up into um, the regions I'm going to show you. So we've got the Dodecanese Islands, the whole of Crete, the Cycladic Islands, and the mainland, including the islands in the Saronic Gulf, Aegina. And my maps are just dots, so you've got to now remember where everything is. Dots are going to move around, basically. <laughs> but first I'll show you some of the headline data, one way to use it, I guess. So this is a graph of um, all the sites um, ranked by that average sailing time to any site in the network. And you see the colours coding for the areas we just looked at. Uh, so you go from a Morgos in the Cyclades, you can get anywhere, or average time to any island, 26 hours to Agia Stephanaos, 54, 54 hours. Now the interesting patterns here are that um, the strength of the Dodecanese islands. So you remember that Ariadne model, Dodecanese didn't really figure. It wasn't very connected. In terms of being able to sail out of those ports, it's pretty strong. Um, not surprising, the Cycladic Islands, just geographically and with the, the, their connectedness anyway, um, they're ranking high. And the surprise may be how weak most of the Cretan sites are. And that's mirrored again when we convert that into my risk measure. Relatively similar, the Cretan sites drop further down. The risk of sailing from Crete is far higher than sailing from almost anywhere else in the network bar a couple of sites, Carpathos and Kazos off the um, east coast of Crete have some very strong currents coming through from the Sea of Crete which make them, they seem very close but they're relatively <coughs> hard places to sail out of apart from to a couple of sites. So that sort of gives a pattern of maybe the connectedness of whole regions in the Aegean. You can then use this data to look at a, a specific site you start with Knossos, how long does it take, and what's the risk of sailing to every other site in the network? Not surprisingly, across all of these, and these are the four sites I've chosen to look at today, not surprisingly, they're connected to their neighbours, so all of Crete's connected to Crete. Less surprisingly, when you look at Cycladic Islands, you get a mix. The Cyclades are incredibly connected to Crete, you know, more so than in within themselves to some degree, and that mirrors that benefit of the wind and currents coming straight from the Cyclades across the Sea of Crete. But you don't see that in reverse. It's hard to sail from Crete north. And I haven't done it today, but one of the things you can do with the data is piece together journeys. So you can start at Knossos and you want to get to X, and you can work your way through the data to potentially find optimal routes. I've just displayed this data in a different way. So these are the, I've only picked the sites we've done and the, the most risky site and the least risky site to show that in graph, in graph form. So as you go along from the least, from yourself to yourself to the next risky site to the most risky. And you get these 
sense of these sites overall connectedness within the network. Surprisingly, sites like Agena are on the geographical periphery of the network actually end up relatively connected sites. Again, not something you see in the network analysis of NAPIT. So now actually maps. Okay, so this is what I actually end up producing. So we've got two maps on each one for each of the sites. The top one, the dots in the back, the red dots are the sites geographically, blue dots are where they've shifted for sailing time out of Knossos. So how does the world appear to that sailor setting out from Knossos? They're not looking at a map, they're not looking at a sea chart, it's how does this world feel to me? And what you see is the Dodecanese Islands draw in, everything draws in slightly apart from the Cyclades which will stay where they are. Going to risk, you get that effect that the mainland islands drift away but the clumping on the far side over here, the Dodecanese Islands, hopefully they're giving you a visualization. If I'm setting out from Crete, how do I navigate this world? What's the least risky route around this world? And I would say it's west via the Dodecanese Islands. From Akrotiri, this is the least surprising one, I guess, um, central to the whole network geographically and beneficial um, from the conditions, everything draws closer but you really see that difference um, where Knossos, the Cycladic Islands appear far away from a risk point of view. If you're setting out from Akrotiri, you've pretty much got a super highway south to Crete. It's a really simple. Um, I'm gonna skip through the next two as well, so here we go. So roads, um, similarly, you get those Cretan islands shifting very close to Crete and Crete become, um, the, I would say the Dodecanese Islands, I've chosen roads are a pivotal in this network now and Agena on the periphery but actually an important um, node in the network. Now I've got three minutes I'll um, show you these which are some of my key observations. So the maritime risks maps produced from this data and this study are a step towards visualizing the worlds of Bronze Age mariners. Following the development and adoption of the brailed rig and quantifying the route choices open to them under sail. Sail power has certainly made the world smaller, uh, but not in all directions and locations equally. The maps presented highlight remarkable differences depending on the home site in question and underline the inadequacy of assuming geograph geographical determinism in ancient networks. The cycladic centrality produced by Napit in the Ariadne model and the strong links across the Sea of Crete are likely, um, but it was a one-way road. It was a road from the Cyclades to Crete. And I would say as well that the removal of Akrotiri from the network wouldn't have had much material effect on the stability, um, which is a conclusion of NAPIT. The usefulness of network analysis in maritime settings based on invariant spatial relations, I hope I've called into question, and suggest the risk of travel provides a more reliable tool and by constructing new maps based on data sets of average travel time and this new measure of risk, network patterns are remarkably different from those from NAPIT's network analysis emerge and highlight the inherent problems of the use of the Western map in archaeological contexts and offer a step to realising the world's and actual risks of Bronze Age mariners. They wouldn't have viewed the world as we do with our maps, but one built through the real risks of travelling and their potential <coughs> progress under sea. The routes they used to maintain were based on not on any geographical or simple maritime determinism, but on a complex interplay of risk, reward, underpinned by the intimate knowledge of their ship's performance, their wind patterns, seasonality, sea currents, and the location of safe harbours. Okay.